असतो मद्गमय तमसो ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शाति 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 ओम लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल लीडर्स फ्रॉम डार्कनेस एंड टू लाइट लीडर्स फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी Om peace 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 is from Peggy Gundal from Boston Swamiji from reading various books on Vedanta I understand that tatvamasi means I am brahman I repeat that phrase during my daily meditations however a christian would never say I am Jesus Christ How can we Vedantins say tatvamasi in this life knowing that there is only one universal and unchanging brahman while we ourselves are continually changing So Peggy is Peggy is asking that uh, uh, that she includes tatvamasi that thou art uh, although that is an instruction given by the guru to the student so when you do it for yourself you would rather say something like aham brahmasmi i am brahman but anyway the point is taken um you are that absolute reality she includes it in her daily devotional prayers uh but how could you say that a christian she says a christian for example wouldn't say i am jesus christ and uh, we changing finite beings and we know that there is an infinite unchanging god how can we say we are that god it's a flat out contradiction so yes a good question these are two distinct ways of spiritual life a philosophy a spiritual paradigms the paradigm of knowledge gyana and the paradigm of devotion bhakti these are distinct the paradigm of devotion it begins with faith that there is a god that we are we believe in such a god and we have faith in this god and this god as peggy says is um, eternal unchanging omnipresent omniscient all the omnis yeah. um we are apparently very small we have a birth and a death if you are a hindu or a buddhist or a jain or a sikh we have many births and deaths but still very limited we go through this life as individuals and so how can we say we are that or i am that the answer is you cannot and you shouldn't not that peggy is wrong in including tatvamasi in her practice but these are two different paradigms of of uh, of spiritual life one is a bhakti paradigm based on uh, faith how do you know that there is such a god notice one thing this god that we speak about eternal omnipresent omniscient unchanging it's a matter of faith for us we have been told that there is such a god we have read that there is such a god our culture tells us our uh, people we revere gurus and uh, um, you know saints have told us and so we believe maybe we want to believe also so we do believe but notice that you don't know the way what do i mean by know the way you know that you exist right now do you know that god exists in this in the same way is it an absolute fact for you no it isn't It, it's that's why there are people who can believe in god who may not believe in god who may believe in a god in a particular way another person may believe in god in another way so all these these possibilities are there because god is a belief is a matter of faith no less real for that but still a matter of faith so this is one approach in spiritual life uh, the theistic religions of the world uh, christianity islam judaism Zoroastrianism and within Hinduism a wide vari- variety of theistic uh, um, streams are there Vaishnavism Shaktaism Shaivism and so on god centered faith based so much so that in the united states religion is called faith belief believing in something one might say yes that's it right no that's not it not all of it there is something else also 
In India, from ancient times, we have known that there can be entirely a different kind of spirituality. A self-inquiry based spirituality. For example, Buddhism doesn't believe in God, doesn't speak about God. Jainism doesn't believe in God, doesn't speak about God. Sankhya, part of orthodox Hinduism, doesn't believe in God, doesn't speak of God. And these are very ancient traditions. Buddhism goes back more than 2500 years. And already Jainism was an elder contemporary of, of the, of, you know, when Buddha was born, Jainism was already there. Um, then uh, Sankhya, Swami Vivekananda called Kapila, the founder of the Sankhya philosophy, called him the uh, first philosopher of the human race. So all that ancient. All right. Now, a Christian who's firmly in the God-centered approach, a God-believing approach, faith approach, definitely would not say, I am Jesus Christ. That doesn't make sense. Clearly, you don't, you don't, you don't see, you see yourself as a person. You don't see yourself as an incarnation of God. There in uh, Christianity, there are strands of non-dual thought. For example, the famous, uh, I and my father are one. <coughs> Jesus Christ saying that. But in Christian theology, that is interpreted as Jesus can say that. Jesus and his father are one. You can't say it. You can't say I and my father are one. So those are devotional religions, theistic religions, faith-based religions, um, God-centered religions. There is another approach which is the self-enquiry based religion. Which is a very different kind of approach. One must first appreciate it. I believe in God. One sentence. Tattvamasi, you are that. Another sentence. But they are not the same kind of sentence. Swami Atma Priyananda, whom some of you have seen here, he told us this story about, uh, about when he became a monk. He was initiated into monasticism. Uh, at that time, our president of the, our order and the guru was Swami Gambhiranandaji. Long time back, decades ago. And, and the day they took, he and his uh, batchmates, when they became uh, monks, they took the vows of monasticism, sannyasa. So somebody, uh, they, they are given the, what is called the Mahavakya. I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. And somebody asked a question to Swami Gambhirananda. So this Aham Brahmasmi, how many times are we supposed to repeat it every day? And the Swami's reply was a laconic. It is meant for realization. It is not meant for repetition. <laughs> Pointing to something, a vast gulf of difference between these two approaches. The approach of believing in something and the approach of realizing, knowing, seeing something for yourself. All right. Um, another example, again from Swami Atma Priyanji, he told us this. He said, uh, one of his Vedanta teachers, Swami Mukhyananda, whom we have also seen, he was a very revered senior monk of our order, a great Vedanta scholar, in order to explain the difference between these two kinds of sentences. What is a sentence? A sentence of doing something, believing something, that's one kind, one kind of teaching. A sentence about knowing yourself, another kind of teaching. To explain the difference, the Swami in class, with, with the monastic novices, Brahmachari sitting in class, so the Swami who had a, um, I also remember him this way, with his long beard and uh, a high-pitched voice uh, and uh, a very old school monk. He, he, with this high-pitched voice, he, he said, uh, the grass is green. <laughs> and all the young monks, they looked puzzled. They looked out of the window. Yes, the grass was green, but so what? The grass is green. And everybody looked puzzled. Mm. And after some time, he said, don't you understand? They shrugged. I guess it's true. It's the grass is green, but so what? Get me a glass of water. And immediately a number of young monks stood up and said, yes, we'll go. Fools, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so they sat down. See, this is one kind, an instruction for a practice, something to be done. Get me a glass of water. Easily understood, can be easily executed. Grass is green is not like that. It's not something to be done. It's something to be known. It's, it's a statement of fact. 
You are Brahman. You are one with the Absolute. That thou art Tattvamasi, Aham Brahmasmi, is like that grass is green. Only the grass is green is a statement about the grass and sort of inconsequential. I mean, it's good, we are happy that the grass is green, but here it is about you. And it does not seem to be true. I am the uh, Absolute, it does not seem to be true, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it is something to be realized. So when the teacher says, you are Brahman, Tattvamasi, what do you do with that? The next part of Peggy's question is, but we are ever-changing, we are small, limited, God is unchanging. Let's stay with that, just a little bit. When I say, I am small, I am changing, changing means I am born and I change throughout life and one day I am going to die. Let's stay a little bit with that. In the path of knowledge, what we will be told is, take a close look at your own experience of life. <coughs> Our life consists of a series of experiences. We see, hear, smell, taste, touch. And notice, what we see, <coughs> what we see, what we hear, it keeps changing. It keeps changing. You are the same. Throughout the day, you see so many things. You hear so many things. Right now, you're on the freeway, listening to the sounds of the traffic and the rainfall outside. Now you're here listening to this talk. What you're listening to is changing, but you have not changed. What we see, what we hear, smell, taste, touch, that keeps changing. So what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, that keeps changing. Our experiences keep changing. But you must admit that you are the same. You're the same one who came uh, on the freeway and you're the same one who's sitting here. You did not change. At this point, Peggy might say that, but we do change, Swami. Well, we have changed from childhood to teenage to youth to middle age and so on. But isn't that the body? Isn't that also something that we experience? That the child's body, the being a teenage person, being a young person, being a middle-aged person, isn't this also part of our experience? This is part of our changing experience. Our thoughts. Yes, our thoughts change so much. I used to think in one way, now I think in another way. My interests were different, now my interests are different. So I have changed. But your interests have changed. Your thoughts have changed. If you change, look at it this way, I and thoughts. If the thoughts changed and I also changed with that, I wouldn't have been able to say that my thoughts have changed. I am the one who noticed a shift in my attitudes, desires, understanding. Therefore my attitudes, desires, understanding changed. The body changes. From birth, to childhood, to teenage, to youth, to middle age. The mind changes. Our knowledge changes, increases or decreases. Our attitudes change. Our moods change. Our memories change. But notice, there is something that experiences all these changes. And the claim is, that does not change. You might ask at this point, Yes, but what does it have to do with me? You are that change, unchanging one awareness. <clears throat> Notice what we think of ourselves when Peggy says, but I have changed. I am a changing, small, changing person. This is a combination of that unchanging awareness and a changing body-mind. This is what Peggy thinks of herself as. That's what we most of, we all think of ourselves as that. As this awareness with a changing body mind, with changing personality. So the path of knowledge, this other, this other path of spiritual life, it asks us to take a close look at our own experience of life and discover the unchanging aspect there itself. There is an advantage to this. I pointed out in the path of faith in the path of belief, this God, unchanging God which we are talking about, which Peggy is talking about, 
it's clearly a matter of belief. You don't experience it. It's not a matter of fact right now. But this unchanging awareness which is being pointed out, which is being discerned, this is a matter of fact. It's not a matter of uh, belief. If you think it's a matter of belief, then you have not understood yet. You have to again pay attention. At every step in this path of knowledge, we proceed on the basis of already available experience and reason. We are po something is pointed out to us again and again and again. When we discover this one unchanging awareness which we are, this consciousness, then the next step, I will not go into those steps now, but in Vedanta you will see. The next step is to see that as bodies and minds, as persons, we may be all different. We are. But as that one unchanging awareness, we are actually not different. It's, it's a lot of philosophy in there, but we are led to see the oneness in consciousness. And finally, we are led to see that one consciousness experiences life. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. This physical universe, this universe of our own thoughts and feelings and memories. And the blankness of deep sleep, all of it appears, plays around and disappears in that one consciousness which we are. And what is experienced by that one consciousness, the objective universe, is actually not different from that consciousness. It is that one consciousness <laughs> appearing to itself as its own object, not distinct from itself. Not accountable second, not accountable second apart from that one consciousness is non-dual. So this one non-dual consciousness is called Brahman. Why am I saying all this? This is the meaning of that thou art. The Upanishad is saying, O oh Peggy, you are that one non-dual Brahman. Right now, all the time, everywhere and here and now, you are that. As a matter of fact, like the grass is green. There is a distinction between this and other spiritual paths. In the path of yoga, the first sutra, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, yoga is cessation of the mod mental modifications. Stilling the mind in samadhi is yoga. It's an instruction, something to be done. But the Upanishadic, you are that, is not an instruction. It's not even as Peggy might have thought. It's not even as a kind of positive affirmation. Mm. I am Brahman, I am Brahman. That's cool. You might think that you are Brahman. But that's not the point of it. Mm. Just as grass is green is not an affirmation. It's a noticing a fact. This is equally noticing a fact. This is the royal road. The road of the Upanishads. The so-called direct path. Mm. Yes. The lady there, could you come up here and ask the question? Yes. Come. Please sit here and use the microphone, tell us your name and ask the question. Namaste, thank you. Keep, my, keep it closer to your mouth, yes. My name is Paula yes. and it wasn't really a question, I just wanted to add something if I may. Yes. Um, as you s have beautifully said, I also believe that all religions are belief until we experience that. And um, I'm currently reading a book called Golden Keys to Ascension, and it's written by a Christian man, and his name is Joshua David Stone. And he has jumped from belief to actual experience, even in Christianity. And so when he writes the book, he also says, I am Jesus Christ. We are all Jesus Christ. We are Jesus Consciousness. So, yeah, that's just what I wanted to add. Yes. And you can do that. But remember, notice what Paula just said. The realization was, we are all Jesus Consciousness. So as Consciousness, we are all these people, and also Jesus Christ, and also that of which Jesus Christ was an incarnation, God. In that sense, in an Advaitic sense, in a non-dual sense. What you cannot say is exactly what Peggy noticed, is that as this person Peggy, I am God. No. The Advaitic path first deconstructs the person. It's flat out contradictory to say, 
I, this guy sitting in the chair is God, literally. No, it isn't. <laughs> That's not true. So Advaita must be understood properly. And like Paula said, even in Christianity, why even in Christianity? In Christianity, in every religion, the core is mystical experience. The core is mystical experience. Experience is possible, not only possible, it, it must culminate in, in uh, experience. Uh, as Vivekananda said, religion is realization. Religion is realization. If God exists, I should be able to see, see God. If I have an immortal soul, I should be able to feel it, right? Is it getting warm in here? We can switch on the... F okay, yeah. Yes. Yes. Stages. Yes, stages. <laughs> can we have a question from the internet audience? I have a question after that. All right. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> um, Jagdish Singh. The microphone. You need the microphone. <laughs> yeah, it's on. Jagdish Singh asks In the Gospel, Sri Ramakrishna says to Swami Vivekananda, you think you are a jnana, but in reality you are a bhakta. You think I am a bhakta, but in reality I am a jnani. What did he mean by this? Are bhakti and jnana two sides of the same coin? You have also said that between bhakti and jnana, bhakti is greater, but there is nothing higher or lower in jnani. Can you please explain? And we have a similar question from Deepti Thakur. Swamiji, you mentioned that Jnana Yoga is the highest form of yoga, whereas in the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna states that Bhakti Yoga is the highest. Can you explain? All right, age-old quarrel between the way of knowledge and way of devotion. <laughs> so the first quote, which... Uh, um, he gives from the in the gospel actually that's not quite right uh, he says uh, Sri Ramakrishna said to Vivekananda but that's not true that it's not there in the gospel it is uh, actually Vivekananda himself who said that you think I am a, a jnani but I am all love inside and uh, the old man, he was bhakti on the outside, inside he was all jnana. That means, old man means Sridham Krishna. So that's a quote from Vivekananda. But anyway, the point is correct. But the, what, whatever has been asked in the question, the point is correct. That we think of Sri Ramakrishna and with good reason. If you see the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, if you read the life of Sri Ramakrishna, he is a devotee. He is a child of the mother. Mother, uh, divine mother, Kali. For him, God was mother. And he re always had the attitude of a child to the mother with regard to God. What, um, now, so we have solid grounds for thinking of Sri Ramakrishna as a devotee, as a lover of God, as a bhakta. And if you see the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna in the Kathamrita, the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, it is predominantly bhakti and he often recommends bhakti very clean, in no uncertain terms. On the other hand, Vivekananda, especially his talks here in the West and also in India, predominantly Vedanta and his life and his teachings from Sri Ramakrishna predominantly a path of knowledge, realization of who am I, I am that limitless Brahman. But here Vivekananda says, it's only what you're seeing is the surface. On the outside, Sri Ramakrishna is bhakti, inside he is all jnana. On the outside, I seem to be jnana, knowledge, but inside I am, I am uh, a bhakta. Yeah, I, am, I am very soft indeed, he says. <laughs> I have the heart of a woman, he says, inside. Um, so, what does it mean? I think it's true for all of us. All of us have elements of this knowledge and devotion love and knowledge now depending on what is expressed outside you might people might categorize you as somebody on the path of knowledge you might yourself categorize yourself as somebody on the path of knowledge and uh, uh, the, the devotional aspect might be a very the love aspect might be a very private thing within you 
others might not see it or might see less of it or the reverse might be true that you might be regarded as a devotee a person who loves and worships and adores god and the knowledge aspect of it might be uh, hidden um, sort of uh, uh, at, at your core uh, inner aspect of it uh, i think it was uh, uh, it was the great psychoanalyst jung who pointed out that every person has the male and the female within themselves Similarly, bhakti and jnana. One of uh, Vivekananda's compositions about Sri Ramakrishna, it goes like this, um, that outside he had the radiant, he put on the radiant cloth of bhakti. And inside, advaya tattva samahita chittam, his mind was constantly centered in the non-dual Brahman. Sri Ramakrishna. Yeah. About Vivekananda, Swami Premeshananda wrote a song with, which has the names of Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, uh, Vivekananda and all the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna and uh, a descriptive word or two about each of them. About Vivekananda, Swami Premeshananda writes Parama Dayala, one of a great heart, the tremendous compassion. So somebody asked, Swami Premeshananda, that we know Vivekananda is this great yogi, this dynamic worker, uh, this great person of, of you know, philosophy and knowledge. But why did you write Parama Dayala, the, of great compassion? And so Premeshananda replied that, who had a heart like Vivekananda? And you will realize as you go forward in life, uh, he was all compassion for, for all of us. On a personal note, if I ask you, what do you think my Pre preeminent disposition is. <laughs> so you are laughing, it seems <laughs> like a no-brainer, what the Americans call a no-brainer. So many people think, yes, my preeminent disposition is knowledge, the path of knowledge, the path of non-duality. I remember a very senior monk, who was one of my mentors, who said to me long ago, more than 20 years ago, he said to me, stop doing that, this I am Brahman, Advaita, non-duality, your path is devotion. <laughs> <laughs> you are a bhakta the inside. <laughs> so, the, and the other point which was raised was that you have, I have said um, that which is greater among the two, bhakti is the highest. In jnana there is no higher and lower. Actually I was quoting a monk, uh, a traditional non-dualist monk from the Himalayas who was asked this question. So it was a provocative question because he was clearly a non-dualist, Advaitin. He was asked in Hindi, Kaun badi jnani ya bhakti? Who is greater, knowledge or devotion? And the monk's startling answer was, Bhakti Bhadi, devotion is, love is higher. And everybody was taken aback. They didn't expect that answer from that monk, because that monk is clearly on someone on the path of knowledge. So they, uh, they asked him, Bhakti Bhadi hai to gyan kya hai? Well, if, uh, if devotion, love is greater, then what about knowledge? And then the monk replied, Gyan mein koi bada chota nahi hota In knowledge there is no higher or lower. See, how beautifully he brought out uh, the two sides. What is the most, I'll put it this way, provocatively. What is the most precious thing in life? What is the greatest thing in life one can achieve? The moment you achieve it, you will be permanently, um, unshakably fulfilled and happy. What's this most precious thing? It is love, love of God. Bhakti, devotion. And what about knowledge? Knowledge is truth. <laughs> Somebody, a monk put it this way. If you want to sleep peacefully at night, do karma yoga. Sel be selfless in life. You will, you will have a great load of your back. Our selfishness is the load that we ca carry on our backs. <laughs> and he says, if you want great peace of mind, Practice Raja Yoga, deep meditation. If you want happiness, practice Bhakti Yoga. You will be immediately happy. Fall in love with God. You will be immediately happy. But if you want truth, <laughs> Jnana Yoga. The uh, other part of the question was that uh, in Gita, right? Well, you mentioned, you mentioned that Jnana Yoga is the highest form of yoga, whereas in Yes. 
<laughs> yes. In the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Krishna states that bhakti yoga is the highest. Right. This is a reference to the 12th chapter um, where Arjuna asks, so you have taught me these two paths, the path of the unmanifest uh, of uh, existence, consciousness, bliss, you know, pure consciousness, and the path of devotion to God. Which is higher? Who is the greater yogi? And Krishna in no uncertain terms says that the path of devotion is better. But he says not higher, he says it is easier. The path of um, attainment of the unmanifest, of pure consciousness, of realization of yourself as pure consciousness, Krishna says that it is, um, uh, it is attended to by greater difficulties. That's all. And then he also goes on to say that those who walk on the path of knowledge, or path of realization of I am Brahman, they too will attain the same reality. See, the uh, insight of Sri Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, no, was that these are different constitutions of our minds. Our spiritual life has actually, it has not started in this life, what, contrary to whatever you might think. Many people come and say, I wish I had known about this earlier. <laughs> you knew about it earlier, you've known about it in past lives. You've just come back to it again. <laughs> so, we have been developing in a particular way for a long time. So that accounts for our tendencies. So something might come much more easily to you. If it comes more easily to you, if it seems more real to you, it seems more live to you, then that's your path. That doesn't mean the other path is lower or um, less important. Another person might take to that path uh, more easily. The, our constitutions are a little different. And therefore, the path of bhakti might be suitable to many, many people. Uh, path of jnana also might be suitable to many people. You take the, there are people who cannot believe in God's state of, unfortunately. They're skeptical. And with good reason. In this day and age, there are more and more such people. And I've seen a lot of people benefit from the path of knowledge. A yeah. lot of people. And I've seen a lot of people coming to the path of knowledge, drawn to that, getting some conviction in that, clarity in that, and then developing bhakti. Mm. That has also happened. Yes, you had a question, ah, and yes. gentlemen, you are next. We'll come to you. I, I can speak. Oh, yeah, no, but you, we need the microphone for the live audience. So, question for hello, our, hello, Araja. Yes. <laughs> so, I wanted to talk about the path of jnana. Right? Yes. And in the third description, it is nidhya nididhyasana. Nididhyasana, right? yes, Vedantic meditation. I also heard a description of it as observation of these kind of mini samadhis in a way, little mm. samadhis that keep coming, the aha moments, the aha, in kind of like Mahayana Buddhism also has a similar. Yes. What is that approach of the mini samadhis, this life as a series of awakenings to mm. bring that over and over again to you? What is that? All right, that's a good question. Traditionally, nididhyasana, which is non-dual meditation, would be equivalent to a prolonged Samadhi. Pro samadhi itself in its definition in the Yoga Sutras is prolonged meditation. Dharana, focus, Dhyana, meditation and then Samadhi. Samadhi would last a deep lasting absorption. Then only it, it satisfies the uh, definition of Samadhi. However, um, in Vedantic Nididhyasana, you remember, you have already gone through the fa phase of listening and uh, studying the truth, going through the teachings. That's the first phase. That's called Shravana. Then comes clarifying the truth, asking every possible question until one begins to get a grasp of it. Clarity comes. That is called Manana. Once we have got clarity, I know the teaching and I know what it means. Now you need to stay with it. That staying with it is called Nididhyasana. You can stay with it with eyes closed and cutting out the world, turning inwards, focusing on the truth which is you've got clarity already. Without the clarity, Nididhyasana will not work. Or you can also with eyes open, engaged in the world also, because the same truth is here. But staying with it is Nididhyasana. Now, prolonged or a series of little absorptions. You can even call it little samadhis. You can tweak the definition of samadhi to relax the, uh, the re requirement that it has to be prolonged. Why would you do that? The reason, it's a very eminently practical step. You do that because our modern minds are not 
to be frank, pure enough, trained enough. We have conditioned and uh, dumped so much garbage into it that it is not capable of deep absorptions. It might come, deep absorption might come, but those are rare and very valuable, but very rare. That doesn't mean one should give up uh, attempting Nidhid Dhyasana, Vedantic non-dual meditation. One can instead have a series of little samadhis. Stay with it. This is one Tibetan monk. He said that it's better instead of trying to prolong deep absorption. If you can, good. There, I know there are a few who can. Yeah. But if you cannot, in most of our cases we cannot. In that case, don't give up. Have these short absorptions, maybe for a few seconds. Then let go. Come back to Shavana Manana and get the clarity and then center yourself and dive deep. And then let go. Why? Because if, you, if at this kind of a mind, if it tries for, to have a prolonged deep meditation, thoughts will come up and in, uh, interfere and ruin your meditation. And then it will be a constant struggle of trying to hold on to something which is already lost. Better step back and jump in again. A series of short absorptions. You can call it little samadhis. <laughs> I am reminded of this British uh, nun who became a, a, a Tibetan Buddhist. She took up Tibetan Buddhism and she became an ordained nun. I think for the first of uh, first one to do so, an English woman. And one of her talks, which I have never met her, but I saw her on online. One of her talks. Long ago, an old documentary, she says to a gathering of Westerners, she says, I'd like to point out that what we have learned from the venerable Tibetan masters, it's not wrong, but they are missing something. They are not like us. They, from their very childhood, they have been brought up in those icy, you know, the Tibetan plateau in, um, in monasteries from very childhood. They have lived, lived a very simple, rigorous life of study and meditation, of austerity and discipline. Their minds are quite different from our minds. So the practices which they say works very well for them. <coughs> Straightforward, as it should. But we need some help. We need certain tweaking of it. So the series of little samadhis is uh, a suggestion which actually came from the Tibetan tradition, from a modern Tibetan ma Modern means he has passed away uh, a few decades ago. I remember, I can't remember. Yeah, I can't remember the name also. The gentleman there, can you pass the microphone? Tell us your name and ask the question. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Irakli. I'm from Georgia. It's not a state, United States. It's a country located yes. in the <laughs> middle Europe. Yeah, it's I post Soviet remember. country. I came from here, mm, from this lecturer, and my friend who uh, translated Ashrawagita to Georgia asked me that uh, ask you this question. He cannot arrive here. I will read it. Uh, and Please okay. do. Uh, it seems uh, that cognitions turn to into one. Before cognition there is observer and object and after cognition there is unity of subject and the object. Therefore one can say I became what I understand or I understand because my essence and the essence of the particular object was the same. From this perspective there is not much difference between Indian dissolve into infinity and Western I think I, I think, therefore, I exist. And the question, do you persuade Advaita as a th something opposite Western philosophy where I is super important, or for your Advaita includes the Western views? Is clear? Right. Uh, it's a very profound question, actually. Uh, I'll answer the question first and then go back to what was said as an introduction. It's a very important insight. Um, so does Advaita, is it something profoundly different from Western views? Western views means there have been strands in ancient Western thought, strands of idealism in, in, in a philosophical sense, in ancient Greek thought, Parmenides, um, and then the uh, Neo the Plotinus school, which are very, very, very non-dualistic. See, this this non-dualistic insight, it's there in every religion. It's there in every religion. It's of course there in Hinduism, 
but it's also there in Buddhism, it's there in Jainism, it's there in Sikhism, it's there in Islam, it's there in Christianity, every religion, Judaism. I've got a book on Jewish non-duality, based entirely on, on uh, Jewish sources, scripture, scriptural sources. So it's an insight, it's there in every religion and that attests to the, the truth of it. However, the claim that we have, the special claim that we have in, um, in Vedanta is that, I'm quoting Vivekananda, it's that perhaps the ancient Hindu came to it first and also it is central in Hinduism. It is one of the primary paths of spirituality. Hinduism is a vast spectrum. But in that one of the primary paths is this non-dual path. Whereas in almost every other tradition except Mahayana Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, in every other religion, in every other culture in the world, it was sort of marginalized, pushed to the, you know, the outliers. In Hinduism it is central and a full philosophy, methodology was developed over the centuries of justifying it rationally and providing a highway uh, with clear steps and practices to attain to that insight. Not only that, for centuries and millennia, there have actually been a body of practitioners in Hinduism. Hundreds if not thousands of monks and lay people who have walked that path. And they are doing so in <laughs> this day and age. So it's a well-frequented, well broad highway, freeway in, uh, uh, in Hinduism. So that's it. The, uh, that's my answer to the question. But let's go back to the initial sentences which this gentleman has written from Georgia, far off Georgia, not this Georgia. <laughs> um, I just say a few sentences pointing to perhaps, you know, th the most direct way of showing this non-duality, which is, uh, which I'm taking from what he has written. It goes like this. Notice our, notice this world, start with the world. Step one. Step two is, notice it's not a world by itself. It's a world in your experience. It's a world in, isn't that what we noticed? That it's a world in my experience. It's not a tree out there. It's a tree which I am seeing. Right now, that tree, it's a, you can't see it, you can see this. This one, this bouquet of flowers, this vase and the flowers here, which you can all see. Two sentences. Sentence one, it's a vase with, uh, with flowers. Sentence two, I am seeing a vase with flowers. Which is more correct? I am seeing a vase with flowers. It's not a vase with flowers in, in isolation of, of, of any subject. The subject is experiencing the object. Now, sentence three, the seeing of the flowers the flowers which I see are nothing apart from the seeing. What do I mean by that? Follow this carefully. If this step is clear, the next steps will be all very radical and stunning. This step, step should be clear. The flowers which you are seeing are nothing apart from your seeing. What do I mean by that? It's pretty simple and straightforward. Light is falling on the flowers and coming to your eyes. The flowers are not entering your eyes, thank God. If you have to call an ambulance, what happened? He saw a vase of flowers, <laughs> now practically blind. No, to the, to the eyes only light comes. Whether it's flowers or this, um, this uh, shrine or the person next to you, whatever we see, the only thing that comes to the eyes is light. That's the only thing that the eyes are designed to accept from the world. By the time it comes to your experiences, you see, even after the light, the next moment it's no longer light. In the retina it's an image. The, the next fraction of a second, it's tiny bits of electrical activity racing along your optic nerves to some brain center. Where is a flower? Where is a tiny bit of electricity? A flower? A tiny bit of electricity in your brain. And then finally, it's an experience of seeing. In your mind, in yourself, you have a, having an experience of seeing. There is no flower there at all. There is no world there at all. There is no light there at all. In, in your brain, is it shining? No. Otherwise, you'd be like light rays would be emanating from every uh, ear and pore of the body. No, 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 no. In your experience, 
There is no flower. There is no light. There are no bursts of electricity, no retinas, no images. In your experience, there is only the seeing of the flower. And that seeing of the flower is pervaded through and through, illumined by you, the one consciousness. There is nothing distinct from consciousness in any conscious experience. Fourth st statement. Let me go through the statements. The conclusion is stunning. World, vas of flowers. St statement one. Statement two. No, no, no. It's a vas of flowers. I am seeing the vas of flowers. That's, that's more accurate. Statement three. The flowers are nothing apart from the seeing. And statement four. The seeing is nothing apart from consciousness. That is Advaita. You have it there. Mm. Somebody is excited. Come, <laughs> come, you can. <laughs> You're wildly gesticulating. So, is it related to this question? No. Oh, it isn't. Oh. You had a related question to this? What? Okay. So we have three people. We'll just take those three uh, questions one by one, two, and three. Please come here. Or you can pass the microphone. That is much easier than. Uh, tell us your name and ask the question. My name is Abhishek. Yes. Uh, my follow-up question was from the uh, Raj, like for Nidhi Tyarsen. We know it's the techniques that uh, we have learned. Now, when we say the enlightenment is momentous, is it to mean that... Enlightenment is? Is momentous. Like, it's, it's like... Momentary, momentary or Mom momentous? Momentary. Like, once you get it, it's not going back. Like, once you... Momentary. Yeah, okay. momentary. So, is it like the, the ultimate meaning is with Nidhid Dhyasan, you realize what is the pure consciousness with this, like I am Brahman, or it is like with the Gnan, when you know that, like, I am not that mirror, I am not that reflected consciousness, I am the witness of that. So the ultimate goal of Nidhi Dhyasana is to stabilize to that or to realize? It's to stabilize. It's to stabilize. Yes. God, yeah. it, you might say, isn't it realizing it? So there is a very ancient debate. These are, there are two sub-schools of Advaita Vedanta. It's called the Vivarana school and the Bhamati school for those who have studied classical Advaita Vedanta. One school says, enlightenment requires Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Hearing, reflection, meditation and the culmination will be enlightenment. That's one school. The other school says, no, no, no. Enlightenment comes from hearing. And the reflection and meditation are only for removing obstacles to that enlightenment. Okay. So I have heard. And now I don't get it. I'm not, I don't think I am Brahman. I've got many questions and even then I don't feel like that I am Brahman. Yes. Um, so what do I do? Recommended that we reason it out. And then we meditate on what we have reasoned. So one school says, Shravana Teva Gyanam. From hearing comes enlightenment. Another one says, no, from hearing, reflection and meditation comes enlightenment. According to one school, meditation stabilizes your enlightenment. Hmm. That it becomes an effortless thing in your life. So that's, that's basically the classical Advaita Vedanta position. Thank you. Then the, we can pass down the microphone, the lady... He, uh, the, we have to no. We have to go there first. That lady there, yeah. and then the lady there. Raise your hand. Yes. Tell us your name and ask the question. Namaste, Swamiji. My name is Asha, and I'm from Dallas, Texas. Um, I don't know if this is correct, so I need your clarity on that. Um, in my, if as a jivatma, when I dream, I'm borrowing some intelligence and material, dreaming material, and creating this dream. So there is some Shrishti, Stiti and Pralaya, if we have to understand. Am I getting a glimpse of Ishwara's role there? That's what Ishwara is True, in a dream we play the role of a mini Ishwara, a mini <laughs> God, by creating dream worlds and uh, then playing around in those dream worlds and dissolving those dream worlds and waking out of it. Now what Ishwara does is the, exactly the same role in this waking world. So uh, given that my dream is, uh, can be different every time. Yes. So, Ishwara holds on to something which is not manifested to? Yes, like Ishwara, uh, power of Ishwara, Ishwara is God. Power of Ishwara is called Maya. And Maya has, one of the aspects of Maya is the storehouse of uh, vasanas, impressions, 
of basically the entire universe in a in a non-manifest form, and a part of that is manifested in each creation. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Avarana, yes, Maya has these two powers. One is to uh, veil and one is to project. So it veils the ultimate reality that you are Brahman and it projects you as your world. Tell us, Vikshepa, Avarana and Vikshepa, uh, veiling and projection. Tell us your name and ask the question. Hi, my name is Tanya and thank you so much. Um, my question is about the statement that came up earlier about is the guy in the chair God? And the que question I have is that if the consciousness is Atman and related to this larger consciousness, Brahma, then why are they not the same? Why is, why is the person not actually God in that sense? And, mm -hmm. if, and if what they're seeing is part of that experience, doesn't that also, doesn't it all start to connect? and become part of the same. All right. We have to quite, uh, carefully tease apart different parts of your question. Mm -hmm. When you use words like Atman in relation to God, mm -hmm. uh, connecting it all, taken. Uh, your, your point is taken. You are talking in terms of as if consciousness is a whole and of which we are tiny parts. Mm -hmm. So are we all related to each other as that one consciousness? You know, mm -hmm. there's a, a oneness a related, a relational whole, an organic yeah. whole. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is one view. This is called Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta. The great master Ramanujacharya. This is how he interpreted and taught Vedanta. About a thousand years ago, um, he said, consciousness is one, Brahman is one organic whole of which we are sentient and insentient parts. All of us, we are parts of that. And we are all related to each other through this one underlying consciousness. Yeah. That's true. But Advaita Vedanta doesn't say that. It's not that you are related to some cosmic consciousness. Or you are a part of some cosmic consciousness. Individual is a part of the cosmic con consciousness. No. What Advaita Vedanta says, it denies the individual and dis denies the cosmos and says there is only one non-dual reality. To understand this, take a simple example, the dream example. In the dream, and we don't remember that we are dreaming, we don't feel that, we think it's, it's normal, we are awake. So we are there and there's a world around us, there are people around us and I am also there as part of that. When I wake up, I realize the whole world I saw there was dreamt up by me and all the people there were dreamt up by me and I who was there in my own dream, that I was also dreamt up by me. Now that I and that, that I in the dream and the world of the dream, would you say that one is part of a greater whole? They're all interconnected. No, 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 no. The whole thing was imagined in that underlying dreaming mind. The you in the dream, the cat and the dog in the dream, the sky and the earth in the dream, are they parts of the dreaming mind? Are there specific locations in the dreaming mind where it's a dog and a cat and a sky and a... Not at all. The whole thing is an appearance in one underlying dreaming mind. Similarly, this whole universe, these are not parts of Brahman. These are not uh, aspects of Brahman. These are not qualities or properties of Brahman. Brahman alone is appearing as all of these. Or, let, give you, let me give you a more troubling example right now this table this wooden table it's wood through and through right it's made of wood through and through I'll assure you that it is <laughs> it's made of wood through and through this table this uh, um, shrine or the altar that podium they're made of wood through and through now what is the relationship of the table to the wood is the table a part of the wood is the shrine is the altar a part of the wood is it a property of the wood? Is it an activity of the wood? No. It is nothing but the wood with a particular form and a name and a function. Isn't it? Similarly, Brahman alone exists and it appears as this universe. This universe is not a part of Brahman. It's not a property of Brahman. It's not a function of Brahman. 
It's an appearance of Brahman. So that's non-duality. Um, so can you pass down the microphone here? Because we are running out of time. We'll have this question to the lady there. And maybe one more question uh, from there and we'll, we'll wrap up. Greetings, Swami. Um, I'm Priya Rangaswamy. Um, so my question is, you've described God as uh, pure consciousness, Brahman, and ultimate reality, and enlightenment. We'll go slowly as there. We've described God as pure consciousness. Or In Brahman. classical Advaita Vedanta, God is that pure consciousness or Brahman with Maya. Or There's a technical definition. Um, maya Upahita Chaitanyam. Consciousness associated with Maya. Or consciousness limited by Maya is maya. called Ishwar or God. All right. Okay. And enlightenment as realizing that oneness or Brahman. Enlightenment uh, in Advaita Vedanta would mean realizing I am that pure consciousness. Yeah. So um, I'm just curious. So uh, we, um, uh, all the religions, various <laughs> religions we practice today, uh, have come to us from various enlightened beings. Yes. And uh, or founded or propagated. And if if all of these enlightened souls realized that oneness, mm. then I'm just curious as to why there are differences in the beliefs in various religions. For example, even in Hinduism, there is Advaita, Dvaita, Vishtadvaita, and uh, yeah. the beliefs around rebirth is not all religions believe in rebirth. True. And uh, even the existence of soul is debated in various religions. So why are there these differences in beliefs when all of these religions have come to us from enlightened beings. Yes, they, this is where Sri Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, Masharada, they come into their own, and th the unique contribution. They are saying that all of these teachings are true. Uh, how can they all be true? Sri Ramakrishna said in Bengali, Tini Ananto Patu Ananto, that ultimate reality is limitless, infinite. And therefore, the paths to that reality also are limitless or infinite. Now, that reality, if it is entirely beyond our conception, it, that's what the claim is, it's beyond our conception, it's beyond language, beyond thought. When you become enlightened and you, you get an insight into that reality, you realize what it is. And then you try to express it in thought and language. You will give one expression which will not be wrong, but it's not all of it. Sri Ramakrishna gave another example of a little ant going to a mountain of sugar. It was delighted to found the find the mountain of sugar. And it got hold of a little grain of it and dragged it back to its uh, home and looked back and said, I'm coming back for the rest of it. <laughs> it cannot. And it need not. It need not. So that ultimate reality being infinite, limitless, we realize some aspect of it. Like the five blind men touching the elephant and seeing different uh, parts of it. Uh, we realize some aspect of it which is not wrong. And as Sri Ramakrishna says, it's that like little ant, that grain of sugar is enough to feel, fill the tummy of that little ant. It's enough for its purposes. Similarly, our realization of God as my beloved Krishna or Christ or as the limitless void, luminous void of um, Tibetan Buddhism or as my um, beloved Lord Jagannath in Puri, uh, or as Aham Brahmasmi, I am that limitless consciousness. Any one of them is enough to liberate you and free you from samsara, give you lasting fulfillment. This is the insight, the great contribution of Sri Ramakrishna to our time. It harmonizes all these various religions by saying that they're all true, they're all valid, and you can realize God through any of those paths. And this is not unique to Sri Ramakrishna. This has been part of the Indian tradition from the most ancient times. If you look up on the wall there, you see Rig Veda, uh, the most ancient uh, of the texts. It says the truth is one, Ekam Sat, Vipra Bahuda Vadanti. The wise speak of it differently. If the truth is one, then why do wise speak of it differently? That was your question. Because that truth is beyond language and limitless. That limitless truth, when you realize it and try to express in language, your expression will be different. Your language will be different, your philosophy will be different, your mythology will be different, your rituals will be different. And they are all true. Aren't they contradictory? No. Different paths are not contradictory. You can reach the Vedanta society by multiple paths. And so they are not contradictory, but they are different from each other. 
But they take you to that goal. They take you to that ultimate reality and they all work. They are all practical. Pragmatically, they are all valid. Good. Let's wrap. Uh, no, we'll take questions next time. And I think we have run out of time actually. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu